okay, it looks like everyone's online or more people are online, so I'm sure we'll have more people join us, but we're going to get started. Um, welcome to our webinar. We are very excited to be here today to talk to you about how to design a high rise with Optigo Connect. My name is Monica McMahon, and I have Ryan Houston joining me today. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm so excited to talk about Optigo Connect and designing a network. We're going to get started. If you have questions at any time, please ask them. We will do our best to get back to them um, in the moment if we can. Otherwise, we will answer them all at the end if we have time. But we do get back to every single question. So let's do this. How to design Optigo Connect. So whenever you're going to design a network, we highly recommend taking our design assistance form and either you filling it out if you know what the network is going to look like or getting your customer to fill it out. So whenever we have someone requesting help, we make sure that this form is filled out by them. Attached to this webinar in the handout, we have an example form filled in. In the email, you also have a blank one that you can use, but we are uh, using the filled in one for this webinar to figure out exactly what our building is gonna look like. So this is, what it, this is the, uh, the form, this is half of the questions on the form. You will see here, we are asking what type of building it is. So in this case, it's a high rise as advertised. Um, it is gonna have 30 floors. So a general description, um, 30 floors, there's one tower. In the future, there's going to be two more towers. There are no space capacity requirements. So um, space capacity can be things like you need to leave 10% utilization for future or one port on every switch or 20 free ports, things like that. Um, this is a brand new building in the case of their example. It's, um, there's no existing cabling because it is a brand new building, but the customer has requested a fiber backbone. They are going to require three to four controllers on every floor. They don't know about their uptime requirements. As for the switch mounting, there's going to be a panel on every floor with the building automation devices. So this is example customer is a building automation customer who's putting in a network for the first time. Um, so they're going to be putting the switch in the panel. They don't know of any other environmental considerations per se. There is a control room and um, we asked about devices that are going to be connected to the network and number of ports. Really all they knew was three to four controllers on every floor. There are no POV requirements and um, in the future there will be two more towers so we should leave a little bit of space for that but right now we're focusing on the one tower. So that's the building we're going to be designing today. Um, and to get started on designing, we have a document called How to Design Optigo Connect. It is a lengthy document and it goes into all the details. Everything we're going to be talking about today is covered in that document, as well as more stuff. We don't have time to get into every single scenario and that covers everything. And we are going to more or less follow the sections in that document. So if you have a second monitor, feel free to open that up, follow along as we uh, continue our webinar here. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we want to know, are we gonna be doing an Optigo Connect hybrid topology or an Optigo Connect spectra topology? And to figure that out, we're gonna use our decision tree. So starting at the top left here, it does look a little bit different in the, in the document and um, the decision tree is also attached to the, there's a handout attached to this webinar. Um, the top left, is it a new building? So in this case, yes, it is a new building. Does it need more than five switches? Well, we have 30 floors with um, three or four devices on each, so yes, it's going to need more than five switches. We can assume at least. We can assume, yeah. Does it need more than 20 switches? We can probably assume that yes, it does, which will bring us over directly to Spectra, but it may not, and, and just to play out all the scenarios, we can look at the no here. Do we want to ensure that major future expansion is possible? In this case, yes. We want to make sure we're going to have two more full towers, so we can go down, and that takes us to Optigo Connect Spectra. Also, when the customer is asking for a fiber backbone, that's typically a good indication that we're going to go Spectra as well, although not mandatory. If you have any questions on the difference between Spectra and Hybrid, we've included that document in the email as well. So Optigo Connect Spectra, those of you following along in the How to Design Optigo Connect, um, you're going to go to the Spectra section, which is the next section. But if you're going hybrid, you'd skip down further. 
Okay. Network topologies, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. With a high rise, it's quite easy. Almost always, a high rise is going to be your passive daisy chain on the right over here. And so we're just going to go directly into that. The star and the self healing ring, you're going to look at more if you have a wide footprint, a data center, a shopping mall, those types of things. So, um, the next document that we are going to reference and recommend you download is our high rise shopping list. And this document was really built to help you if you have a high rise. Um, that you're trying to design to give you all the different things you need. So I highly recommend you take a look at it, download it now, and it looks exactly like this image. So here we are. We have a high rise. We're going to do a passive daisy chain. What next? Well, there's a few different options. On the left here, we have this building, and every single uh, floor has a 401i. So we've taken our smallest switch and we've put it on every floor. There's a specific reason for that. We recommend putting a switch on every floor, but it's not always possible. It's not always the um, most cost-effective option. Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit more about the difference between putting a four port on every floor versus a 24 port on every second or third floor? Yeah, 100%. So when you, obviously we would love you to put a, a switch on every floor. The main reason for that is it's very repeatable. So you can build a, a box or a can with the four port in it, with the power supply and all the associated components and replicate it. So you can stick it under in each floor, put it up the electrical riser, and it's just rinse and repeat all the way up the riser. It's very, very quick, easy to do in a panel shop. Furthermore, if you're going in to service this after you install the product, you don't have to skip between floors. You can go directly to the floor that's a possible problem, either with the network or with your entire VMS system, and everything's contained to that one floor. The other advantage, or the other way of doing this, is to do a switch for every three floors. But keep in mind, if there's a problem on the floor above you, your connection point is the floor below you. So you're not as close to all the equipment that you need to service. There is a cost advantage, of course, uh, going every three floors. So there's a trade-off between your upfront capital cost to what it's going to cost you in an operational sense to service and maintain the building later. Yeah, there's also um, some future-proofing considerations. If you're putting a bigger switch on every three floors and that switch is almost full, in the future you, you may not be able to upgrade to a bigger switch there. Whereas if you have a four port on every floor, you can upgrade to an eight or a 16 in future if you need more, um, more ports. And this is offering more services to your client. If you want to add lighting, if you want to add a couple of cameras, if you want to add access control, whatever comes down the pipe, more energy meters, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So having more availability to connect more products will service your customer better. Yeah. And we often have people say, well, we want to run less cabling, so we want to have the um, switch on every third floor, but in reality, then you're just going to be running the cabling to your device from the switch to your devices instead of the one cable to the to the switch. So it definitely comes down to your preference and the building and um, budget, but those are some things to consider when you're trying to figure out the density. So um, we're going to start building our network. Every single Optical Connect network starts with a network controller. So you'll see here we have our green network controller. That is the brains of the system. It hosts Optigo OneView, which is your network management system. And then paired with that is going to be our Spectra aggregation switch, so our ONS S8. And that is the brawn of the system. Every Spectra system is going to have an ONS S8, um, and these two are always paired together. From there, um, we are going to run two fibers. We'll talk a bit about why we're going to do two fibers in a minute, but we're going to move on to our switches first. So we need to figure out which edge switches we want to choose. We have six different edge switches, and there are four main things, although there are a couple of other small considerations. There are four main things to consider when you're looking at your switches. The first one, the, the most obvious one, is how many ports are there? How many devices can you actually connect to this switch? So we have four, eight, 16, 24, and 48 port switches. The second thing is how are they mounted? So we have three that are DIN rail mounted. Those are industrial ruggedized switches. 
Those are great if you're going to put them into a panel. The other three are rack mounted, so those fit really well into your standard IT setting. If you have a rack, you have an IT room. Um, and then thirdly, thirdly um, PoE, power over Ethernet. All but one of our switches uses PoE, so if you are going to put one device on the floor but you need PoE, you won't be able to use the four port, but all the others use PoE. There's some important considerations here for your X switches. The panel mount is a great solution, especially in wider temperature environments, boiler room, for example, or, or up close above the ceiling. And one of the things to look at is the size of the switch. You may need a deeper can, you know, an eight inch can as opposed to a four inch. And the other thing to think about is what are you going to do later? If you get past, say, 16 ports in that can, now you have to switch out your entire infrastructure to support that and go to a rack mount. So if there's a possibility of going past your 16 ports, you may as well just start with the rack mount design right away. And there are options to put a rack mount inside a cabinet enclosure, but there's a lot of ways to install that. But that gives you now the ability to go from, say, an 8 port to a 48 port. So you get a lot more room for future expansion. So always good to do that up to think about that upfront cost right away. Mm -hmm. Also keep in mind from a mounting perspective, our um, well, 801 and our 1601 on the uh, DIN rail mount side can be mounted on their side to fit into a panel more easily. So with our switches in this design, um, we are going to go with a, a switch on every floor because he has um, he or she has three or four devices on every floor. Um, we are going to make troubleshooting and their lives as, as simple as possible by putting a switch on every floor. So we have a choice. Um, we can use a four port or an eight port. The thought process here is we can put a four port, but that is going to have them at capacity. So three to four controllers on every single floor. That means potentially every switch is going to be completely full. We don't recommend doing that because if you end up with a fifth device that you need, you didn't think you'd need it, but it, it comes up, or three weeks after the building is done, you need another device, you need to completely replace your switch. So um, we always like to look at future considerations. So in this case, we're gonna go with the 801 PI because it's going to be um, mounted in the panel, and that gives us some space for future growth so we're going to have a, an ONSC 801PI on every floor. There we go. So we, we uh, didn't have room for all 30 floors on our PowerPoint slide. So we've just put four of the switches out there. Um, and we are going to get into, uh, actually, I'll, I'll wait till we get there. So these are our, um, our switches. Ryan, do you want to talk about bandwidth? Absolutely. So bandwidth is always exciting. You need to have a general idea of how much bandwidth you're dealing with in any network. Typically in BMS, because we're dealing with HVAC-based devices, your bandwidth isn't a concern. In the optical system, you get one gigabit per second of bandwidth for every fiber run. That means there's eight fiber runs in an S8, so we can do a maximum of eight gigabits per second in the entire system. Now, in this case, we're only running two fiber runs, so you can get uh, one gig each. Note that this is, uh, it all goes through the fiber, so it doesn't go through a switch and then uplink to another switch. It goes straight to the fiber run. So you can take advantage of pretty much all of that uh, one gig of data. Now, if you're adding other systems that are heavier in uh, bandwidth, then you want to think about maybe separating the system even further. As an example, if you're adding cameras into the system, that can make a difference on how much stuff you put in here. As an example, if you're going to use a standard camera, we're going to run, say, five megabits per second average on a sort of past HD resolution on a camera. You can run 200 cameras in the system. You won't have any room left for any HVAC components. So there's a trade off. Typically, in, in BMS, energy, lighting, uh, all of those types of systems, including some analytics, we don't have a bandwidth problem. It wouldn't be something for you to worry about. But just in case you were concerned or later uh, in future considerations of the building, we have this little monitor built into the system. So when someone asks you how much bandwidth do I have left, you can actually answer the question. And you can say, don't worry about it, you're good. 
it'll still work. But we, rec we recommend uh, thinking about it as you're designing rather than standing up your whole system and then going, oh, our bandwidth is fully utilized. Fixing it after the fact is going to be much more expensive. It's a little harder. Okay. So in this case, um, we have a few building automation controllers. It's not, bandwidth isn't going to be a huge issue, so we're not going to dive too deep into bandwidth today. Um, but if you have any questions, let us know. So passive optical splitters. So our splitters are um, passive devices. They don't require any power, and they allow us to split the light that's going to the, the, the fiber. So basically, we have one input of light, and then we have two coming out. Now, the very cool thing about designing for a high-rise is that we have these asymmetrical splitters. And so those allow us to create a passive daisy chain without using up all of our, our bandwidth. So essentially how they work is we have one input coming up the, the trunk, coming up the uh, back one of the building. And then when we split it, instead of splitting half of the light to one and half of the light to the other, like a lot of our splitters, it actually splits 95% of the light in one um, fiber and 5% in the other. So the, I am referring right now to this A05 splitter. Can you lift that splitter up? I Sorry. see how big it is. Uh, I can't see what you can see. Ah. Um, there we go. So, yeah, so we have 95% of the light coming out of here, 5% going this way. So the 5% is going to go on to your switch, and 95% is going to continue up the building. And then at the next splitter, Another 5% is going to be split off. 5% of that 95% is going to be split off, and 95% of the remaining will continue. So that allows us to have way more bandwidth going a lot higher. However, at some point, we are going to get to um, a point where we aren't going to be able to, the 95% that continues won't be enough. And so we are going to have to start using an A10 splitter if I can get back there. And the A10 splits 10% of the light off and keeps 90% continuing up the, um, the trunk. And so there is a maximum a number of seven A5s and six A10s. After that, the trunk won't have enough light to keep a switch going. Um, so, and then the, the very last split at the top is going to be a two split. So 50% one to one switch and 50% to the other switch. So I hope that makes sense. Um, the other, if you have questions, ask us. The other thing that is a great consideration with when you're designing a high rise with our splitters is we have these really long lead splitters, which I've dropped all over the floor, but they have much longer, um, longer leads than our typical splitters. I've made a mess of this, but as you can see, there's a lot of fiber here. And that allows you, rather than having to run fiber up the building and connect the splitters into it, it allows you to actually connect the splitters to one another and not having to run any additional fiber through the building. And so you can, uh, the long leads are 20 meters or 65 feet. Is that right, Ryan? 65 feet. 65 Correct. feet. So you can connect two up to even three floors depending on your um, building and, and layout and conduit um, layout. You can connect up to three floors with our, our long range splitters, long lead splitters. Also note in those splitters, they come with a pull eye and a pulling sock on them, so you can attach it to your pull string and uh, have no problem pulling it through those locations. And so if you are going to, um, if you want to use the long range splitters, make sure you have a product number with the LR here, and that will get you that extra long lead. And these are specified in the shopping list. They are in the shopping list. Okay. So on our, um, on our high rise, as we said here, we have the we have our A05 here, our 5% being split off to the switch and 95% continuing up. Um, and because we have seven of the A5s and then six of the um, A10s and then the two, the, the regular 50%, 50% split at the top, we can only do up to 15 uh, switches. So because we're going to be connecting 30 switches, we are going to be running two different fibers from our ONS S8. So keep in mind that our ONS S8 
Um, it's called S8 because you can run eight fibers from it. So you can do, in if you're using this topology, you can do up to eight fibers, each with 15 switches on them. Next, we're going to, so we've added our seven A5s. We're going to add six of our A10s now. And then we're going to add this last split is the 50%, 50%. If you, if you want to know more in depth, we have a budget calculator, which we'll talk about in a moment, but these are calculated by math. Uh, what would I say? These are actually calculated values so that this formula works perfectly. It will never, it will keep you out of trouble every time. So as long as you follow this, you'll never get in trouble. You'll never not have enough light. You will never struggle. Yeah, and if you're doing a different topology, um, there's a way to calculate exactly what's going to work for you. We've done that with the high rise. We've done it hundreds of times with the high rise. And so we know that this is what works. Um, and it, it actually makes it quite simple to design a high rise. Maybe not the first time, but it, it does get quite easy. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions about that. Hopefully that's fairly clear. The next thing is going to be our SFPs are small form factor pluggables, but you do not need to know that acronym. Um, so <laughs> every fiber run coming from the ONS S8 needs to have um, an SFP. So on on either end of that SFP, there, on either end of that fiber, there's going to be an SFP. You have an SFP plugged into your ONS S8, and then you'll have an SFP plugged in to the edge switch. However, it's very important to note that these are different SFPs. So we have the ONS SX SFP plugged into the S8, and we have the ONS CX SFP plugged into the edge switches. If you're trying to remember SX and CX, SX goes with the S8, and CX goes with the C401I, the C810P, the C, all of our edge switches are Cs, and our, um, our aggregation switch is an SX. So that's why the names. And that should make it easier for you to remember. There's also labels on the box. I believe there's labels in the bag. There's some yeah. pretty adept instructions in the box as well, just to make sure you keep this, keeps you out of trouble here as well. But it is very, very, very important that they are not interchangeable, and your system will not work if you put the CX into the SX and the SX into the CX. I believe there's a alert that will come up on the system saying that it's incorrect as well. So make sure when you're ordering, you get the right one. Okay, so we added our little tiny F, um, SX SFPs in here and our CX SFPs in our edge switches. Um, so you'll see there's one per edge switch and there's one per um, fiber run on the F8. So we've added that to our bill of materials as well. Optical budgeting. So the budget calculator is here to go through the, the different splitters and the light drop per splitter. Every single time light goes through a splitter, you're going to lose a little bit. And this calculates what that loss is so that you can make sure you have the right amount of light to the switch. Think about like a flashlight. If you put that right in your eye, it's going to be way too bright and I can't see anything. Put it further away, that's perfect. Put it too far away and it's a tiny little dot that's not really helpful. That's what we're aiming for. And there's a sweet spot and range that we go after and it's between uh, four, minus 14 decibels all the way to uh, 26. And you can see everything in the green on the sheet is within that range. And that's what we strive for. The sheet's available for the download. It's already pre-filled out. So you can play with it and see what the impact of changes are. Yeah, so um, again, we're not going to go into detail, but you can see on each switch there's um, two different values. And the YPS, uh, YPS2 A05, there's the 0.3 and the 13.1. Those are the two different splits coming from it. And you can calculate. We will, uh, we will go into this more on a separate video, and feel free to ask us if you have questions. But you can always use the 15 switches with the 7 A5s and the um, 6 A10s and the 1 YPS2 for a high rise. It will always work. It will always work. So we've talked a little bit about future expansion, but it's very important, especially when you're going, okay, I think we've got our design, we're good, um, to, to come back and think about the future of this building. Um, so if you're going to add new devices in the future, there are a few different things you can do. The first and the most obvious and easiest is use open ports. So we're doing an eight port. There should be four open ports on most of those. Um, you can go and just throw it into that device. Of course, if you've lost your ports, you might need to open them, all that kind of stuff. But 
um, physically there is an open port. If you are using a four port, then you can switch that out for your eight port. You can switch it out for a 16 port. If you're using the eight port rack mounted, you can switch it out to our 24 port. Um, so it might be something to think about, as Ryan mentioned earlier. If you are um, considering an eight port, maybe use the rack mounted one from day one because the ability to upgrade with a rack mounted solution is much higher. We can go up to 24 or 48 ports, whereas the DIN rail mounted one can only go up to 16. Um, and switching out of a switch for a larger switch is not too challenging to do. Um, technically, it can be fairly easy. Um, the third thing is you can add additional splitters. So in our design, we can't add any additional splitters. We've, we've, we're at capacity with our 15 splits. However, if this was a 20-story building and we were running two different fibers up it, we would be able to add a few more splitters, add some new switches. Um, so depending on whether or not you're at capacity, that is an option. Finally, um, you can run a new fiber line from the ONSS 8. So in our situation, we're running two of, out of eight, out of the possible eight. So we have two different uh, fiber runs. We could run a third one. Now, in this example, we do have, um, we, we, we're, we've completed our design of one of three buildings. The other two are going to be built in, built in the future, apparently, according to our customer. So um, probably two more of those will be used in the future. So that is something to take, keep in mind. It should be fine for the future, but if you're going to be adding a lot more devices, you might need more fiber runs. But if you have a design with no open ports, all of your bandwidth is used, um, you're, you have all of the largest switches, and you're using all eight fiber runs, we highly recommend redesigning because you are just backing yourself into a corner, and that is making for a really, really painful future when you need to add one device because how hard is it going to be when the customer says, oh, I just want to add this one device and suddenly you're saying, okay, well, we need a new network controller, another S8, we need to run a new fiber line. It's, that's a bit crazy. So always um, keep in mind the future trade-offs. Of course, you don't want to completely over-design your system and have, um, you know, 20 open ports on every floor, but you also don't want to under-design. Okay, so continuing to fill out our bill of materials here, um, you will need to buy for every network, you will need to buy the um, license for the ONS, um, for the Optical One View software. So um, the way the pricing for this, or the way the, the license works, the first 100 ports are free. So it's based on the number of ports on the system. Um, we have 30 S8s, which means we have, I didn't do this math ahead of time, 244. 240 ports. Um, the first 100 are, are free, so we have 140 ports. Each um, additional license gives you 100 ports, so we'll need two additional licenses. So we're going to add to our bill of materials here uh, two software licenses for Optical One View. And that gives us a nice GUI so we can manage this whole network. Then you'll want to add some power supplies. So um, important to know that our um, DIN rail mountable switches, which are um, industrial industrial switches, they require an external power supply. So you want to make sure that you order that, um, whether it's from us or from someone else. It doesn't matter. They just need power. Um, the rack mountable switches do have internal power supply, so you don't need to add a power supply to your order there. Just note on your UL requirements, if you have any when you're installing these in, in um, your control cabinet, that you'll, you'll have to, your mounting of the power supplies may change depending on those requirements. And if you're looking at price trade-offs, um, because of the power supply, the additional power supply, it can make our recommended solution a better option affordability-wise. Including installation. Yes. Couplers. So couplers are these tiny little things that fit on the end of a piece of fiber. Um, and they basically, Ryan was mentioning earlier, they, um, no, sorry, I'm getting things mixed up. Um, they allow you to connect two pieces of fiber together. So um, if you are going to be running long range, uh, long lead splitters, 
you can connect them directly together using a coupler rather than connecting them into a um, fiber that you've had to run up the building. So we always recommend one coupler per splitter. So we'll want to add that to our bill of materials. Remember, you don't have to cut the fiber. You don't have to have a fiber tag. You simply bring it in and plug them together. So it's no different than an Ethernet coupler or even for, for some of us old guys out there, the coax couplers, it's all the same thing. But the one thing that you will need that is very, very important is to keep your fiber clean. So if you are gonna go in there and you're gonna be taking your long range splitter and you're gonna be putting a coupler on and connecting it, you're doing it all yourself, that's fantastic. But it is crucial that you keep the fiber clean. Anytime you take the cap off, clean the fiber. Anytime you're not using it, keep the cap on it. Because as Ryan was mentioning earlier, it's like if you have a flashlight and then you start putting dirt all over that flashlight, suddenly the light isn't as powerful. And so if you are having all this dirt all over, and, and in, the, in the case of a fiber, a dirt is tiny little particles that can be in the air, especially if you're in a dusty mechanical room, um, make sure that you clean it. And second note on that, Clean, you, fiber is not like your, your glasses. You can't just clean them on your shirt. You can't just grab the towel and clean it. You need to use actual fiber cleaner. Can't use my shirt? Are you sure? <laughs> It'll probably just make it more dirty. Um, so make sure with every project, we always recommend that you have a fiber cleaner on site. It is very cheap and will make everything go a lot smoother. I cannot tell you the number of support issues we've had that would have been resolved if the fiber had just been cleaned. And this isn't, don't forget, this isn't always you guys installing it. If you've got subcontractors installing it and they have not done the fiber or made it clean, then it comes back to you, back to your company trying to troubleshoot it. It will take you an immense amount of time. Even if that's your first step, just go through and clean the fiber ends, problems most likely will be resolved. So always start there. And this is a very critical step. And and the, the thing that is so interesting about this is, Often the difference is just having the fiber cleaner on site and not. If you have it there, it's easy to use it. It's easy to just do it. But if you didn't order it in your bill of materials and someone goes, oh, we need to go and buy one online, it, it can really slow things down. And then you end up going, why is my switch coming online and offline? And, you know, it's, it's very painful. So fiber cleaner. I think, we've, I think we've got the point across on that one. <laughs> fiber patch cables. So fiber patch cables are a... Um, small or depending on the length that you order, a uh, piece of fiber that just connects two splitters. So um, another thing that we recommend having on site, if your long range splitters don't quite reach where they need to go or you need to connect something that you didn't expect, these can be really, really handy um, to just to, so that you don't have to go and source some other fiber. Uh, so I, I recommend having a few on, on hand when you're going to be installing the building. And those come in lots of different lengths. Attenuators. So attenuators um, reduce the light signal when it's too strong. So like Ryan was saying earlier, if you shine a flashlight in your face or you look at the solar eclipse, you're not going to be seeing much for a while except for some big dots. Um, and so same thing with fiber. The attenuators come with the SFPs. There's a, um, I believe they include a 5 and a 10 dB attenuator. And so those will be handy if you're not, if you're not using all of your bandwidth, you can use these to make sure that you have the right amount of light being transmitted. Here's an example of why this matters. Is when you look at our high-rise riser, we're using seven of the AO5 sliders, six of the A10s, one YPS, two at the top. Okay. So if you install all of your network and only start at the top and have the YPS2, the 50-50 splitter at the very top coming back to the switch, you have way too much light, and that switch will not communicate on the system. It will once all the other splitters are added and it's knocked down enough light to make it work. So in bringing up your system in transition, there's going to be periods where it may or may not work, depending on how the system is put together. So this, what we're designing for, is the end result. So these come in the box. We ship a couple along with it. So if you have a problem, you can put them in temporarily to make sure the system comes up perfectly every time. And then we can add and remove them as the system gets built out. Okay. So this is also very important. 
We always recommend that you order a couple extra couplers, patch cables, and even SFPs because they're very inexpensive. You know, couplers, patch cables are dirt cheap, and if you have to hold up your installation because you can't connect two pieces of fiber because you don't have a coupler, that's going to cost you huge amounts of money, huge amounts of frustration, and um, it's really easy to avoid that. So always have a few extra on site. If you have um, people that are installing more than one optical connect network on a, on a regular basis, get a little, um, a little sort of what am I saying? A kit. Get a kit of a couple of cables, a couple few couplers, SFPs. Um, it'll make your life a lot easier. Just know when you're in the job, this could be two days. Even if we overnight it, you're still out for minimum 24 hours before you get this product, depending on how fast it takes to order through your supplier. So it's it does take time. Yeah. So this is our um, our design. This is our network. Um, if you have any questions, now is a good time to ask them. I do see one question here, and once we answer that, I can go a little bit into a, a different option that you could do. But first, I'm going to answer this question. How does this configuration with network management slash aggregation devices differ from one using an IP router? Ryan, you want to take that? From the IP router itself? If you've got a, an IP router, such as a Layer 3 router, which would connect between our NC600 S8 and the intranet, that's what it's for, it sends out and configures that uh, network connectivity oh, no. for different IP addresses and that sort of thing. Now, you could easily take one of those and set an IP address to each one of these 30 switches, and that wouldn't be a problem. But if you want to go in and manage each one of these 30 switches, that's 30 different IP addresses, that's 30 times the repetitive task to set it up, and 30 individual logins that you have to do to manage this network. At the end of the day, it's simply not going to be managed because it's too much work. So that opens you up to security holds. It opens you up to a lot of uh, pain in terms of maintenance uh, and operations and service. The whole point of running the NC600 and S8 is to simplify that and have one central point of a view into the system so you can manage everything in bulk configurations. You don't have to worry about 30 IP addresses. You worry about one which is the, the head end in the aggregation switch. And that whole process saves an immense amount of time in running that building. Okay, I hope that helps. So what we will look at now um, is we wanted to show you a different option. So often when a customer comes to me and or Ryan and asks for a design, like we showed you, we get a certain amount of information at the beginning but we may or may not get a lot of feedback on what's possible or what their budget is and that type of thing. Um, and so as we mentioned at the beginning, it is possible to put a bigger switch on fewer floors. And this is an example of that. Um, so we, have, we still have that ONS S8 and the network controller. We still have our SX SFP, but we're only gonna do one fiber run. And we're going to put five 24 ports, or I guess putting five, three, and then two. So 10 24 ports. And we're going to have um, five A10s, or five A5, three A10s, and then a two split here. Yeah, so in this case, you run a little bit of, from whatever floor you're on, you run a little bit of copper Ethernet up to the top of the floor above you and some down to the floor below you. There's, this can be a, a cost, cost competitive advantage or an alternate pricing if you want to go at it that way. The, the trade-offs, as we discussed, is between the capital costs and the operational cost. This is traditionally in IT networks, this is common, but it really depends on what you're, you're trying to push and what the customer wants, especially when you're looking at buildings with possible TI work, tenant improvement work. You really don't know what you're going to add, so it's hard to design a network that's going to encompass everything. In terms of a network like this, because you may have used all the light, it's not so easy to put an, an additional switch between the floors without switches, because you'd have to redesign the fiber network. So you could design it like this. You could also design it to leave room in the fiber budget to add switches in between. It's a lot of ways to do it, but this is really reserved for 
either sites that are cost competitive uh, as an alternate to the original pricing as maybe a retrofit if it's already designed this way. There's reasons for it, but we always strive with the switch per floor and work our way down from it. Yeah. This is something that um, looks uh, looks better at the beginning and will annoy you for the rest of your time working on that building. Do we have any more questions? Or am I here to assume that you are all professional Optical Connect high rise network designers now? All right. Um, I'll, well, if any more questions come in, we'll answer them. But do make sure that you take a look at those handouts. Um, and if you are going to be designing a network, you should be able to more or less completely design your network using the design guide as well as either the high rise shopping list. We also have a shopping list for a high rise with redundancy um, as well as a um, wide footprint building. So depending on the type of building that you're going to be designing, we can get um, you can pull up the right document and it will go through all of the different things that you'll need. Um, and we will send those out in an email afterwards as well. As always, feel free to ask us for help and get our feedback on those designs. But hopefully you are now able to go and get started on your own. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, happy designing. Thank you.